Welcome, everyone. I think this is my first time introducing someone in front of SAFL for any kind of seminar audience. So my name is Andy Wickert, and I'm one of the faculty here and also in Earth and Environmental Sciences. So it's my great pleasure today to be able to uh, welcome uh, Sarah Holger. Sarah is the interpretive ranger at Whitewater State Park in southeastern Minnesota, where she works with a combination of science, outreach, education, both in the park and in the surrounding community. And Sarah is here as part of the Beyond the Lab seminar series that Claire Borgter is putting together and has been growing to connect with people working on problems involving water, involving sediment, involving environmental fluid dynamics that goes beyond the reaches of our laboratory, but remains in our local communities. So Sarah is in fact, uh, has some history at the U. She, um, she got her degrees, did her education in the College of Natural Resources, now CFANS, in the university over on the St. Paul campus. And from there has spent um, a huge amount of her career, perhaps even her entire career, at Whitewater State Park, um, working with the DNR and then eventually becoming the interpretive ranger. So with that, um, Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, did I do this right? It's green. Awesome. Okay. Super. So I am um, what, at Whitewater State Park. One of our main interpretive themes is um, talking about the watershed um, because there's a just a fascinating story of human relationship and land use and um, catastrophe and I guess you could say kind of restoration. Um, and the Whitewater Valley and that watershed has been kind of a case study that's been looked at nationally. Um, so I'm gonna take you through a presentation that I use with the general public. We talked earlier, we at our panel conversation earlier today about how do you engage the, the public in some of these types of um, topics and themes. And so doing a field trip where we go to a ghost town and tour a ghost town cemetery, that's something that people say, oh, I wanna, I wanna learn about that, that sounds interesting. And they don't realize that it's a whole focus on watershed. <laughs> So I usually, you know, once I get them there and, and warm up the audience a little bit, I say, how many of you came to this program today because, uh, you know, you thought it sounded kind of spooky, kind of scary, right? And, oh, and you're here to, you know, kind of maybe get scared a little bit. And, you know, most of them raise their hand and I say, well, buckle up because this is a scary story about our watershed. And then they're like, what? <laughs> so uh, it, it does draw in a lot of people. And we will usually start with this presentation and then we caravan um, in vehicles up to, it's probably nine miles up to this ghost town where we um, toured the cemetery. There's not much left of the, the town anymore, but the cemetery was um, up on a terrace. So it's intact and we can learn from the graves and the stories of the people that are buried there about what happened in this valley. So I'm just gonna take you through this presentation and I have added some audio because we've been doing an oral history project. So I incorporated a few excerpts from some of the oral history stories. Um, but I always start out with this quote, um, you know, water's obviously important for life on this planet, but water also links us to each other. So I really like this quote, water links us with our neighbor in a way more profound and complex than any other. Um, and I usually start out just asking folks what a watershed is. Hopefully you all know what a watershed is, but it's uh, fascinating how many people are, have no idea when. So, uh, we, you know, we'll explain that. And then we'll we'll look at some examples. So like the Mississippi River watershed is this massive, huge watershed, right? That drains down into the Gulf of Mexico. And then we have smaller scale watersheds. So across Minnesota, lots of different watersheds. Ours is highlighted there on that map in the upper left. Um, so the Whitewater River watershed is about 205,000 acres. Um, so the bottom right photo here, this is showing the black area with the stripes in it. That's Whitewater State Park. Um, and I'm going to show you another map a little bit later in the presentation. Whitewater State Park's about 3,000 acres, just under 3,000 acres. And then there's a wildlife management area that's kind of a corridor to the north of the park that follows the Whitewater River. And that's about 30,000 acres. So that's public lands as well. The star on the map is showing where this beaver village used to be or the cemetery there. And we have three forks of the Whitewater River, the South Fork, the Middle Fork, and the North Fork. They all join together. Um, at this little town called Elba, um, and then flow northward into the Mississippi River. So this is the watershed we're gonna be talking about here. And you're gonna get excited. We're <laughs> glaciers <laughs> going back. I like to set the stage um, for you know, people visiting Whitewater State Park. The landscape that we see today is this very, um, we say romantic landscape. It's very, it's got these dramatic, 
valleys and uh, tall bluffs. It's very, very scenic, very beautiful. Uh, but why is the landscape the way it is? And so we go back, you know, to the last ice age, and that's a big part of the story. Um, those last glaciers missed um, areas of the state. So southeast Minnesota, along with southwest Wisconsin, northeast Iowa, and northwest Illinois is known as a driftless area. Um, I mentioned earlier, I grew up, you know, west of the Twin Cities, Lake Minnetonka area, which looks very different than southeast Minnesota. Um, lakes more flat, uh, less of that steep topography. So as we get down into southeast Minnesota, you can just see the terrain is different. Um, and we also have interesting things going on under the ground, a landscape known as karst. Um, we have this highly dissolvable bedrock, these limestones and sandstones that are really exposed to the surface because they didn't get buried under all that glacial sediment that was deposited over the rest of the state. So our sinkholes and caves and disappearing streams and springs and all kinds of just interesting things going on underneath the ground in southeast Minnesota. So it's a really uh, interesting landscape around the whitewater area. So instead of lakes, we see these streams, um, trout streams with cold water that are fed by the springs. Also, when we look at climate, um, southeast Minnesota is unique from the rest of the state. It's the wettest part of Minnesota. It's also the warmest part of Minnesota. So when we combine the precipitation with the warm temperatures, we have tropical Minnesota. So um, this is where I think it's over 46% of all the rare plants and animals in Minnesota are found in the southeast Minnesota driftless area. So um, unique habitats, unique plant communities. Uh, we have the hardwood forest. We're in that kind of that strip that runs diagonally across Minnesota, the hardwood forest. Um, we also have the floodplain forest along the rivers there uh, with plants that can tolerate more saturated soils. We have active sand dunes and sand prairies. Um, these are usually located along these ancient rivers. Uh, we've got oak savanna, which is one of the rarest ecosystems on the planet today. It used to be a very common, common plant community um, across southeast Minnesota. Uh, we have these goat prairies or bluff prairies that are found on the south-southwest sides of these steep slopes, um, very hot, dry areas um, that were maintained by fire for many, many generations by the indigenous people of the area. And then on the, what's really fascinating about the, the bluffs in southeast Minnesota is you can walk around a bluff and on each side of it is a, is a different plant community, you know, because you've got different topography, you've got di different sunlight and um, temperature and moisture. So oftentimes on the north um, sides of these slopes, they don't get any sunlight and you'll have relic um, communities that are left over from the last ice age, which is really cool. So they call these algific talus slopes. Um, and we do have some of these in Whitewater State Park. Um, if we look out, you know, over time, uh, lots of different animals using the, the whitewater valley. So some of the, the more charismatic megafauna here, <laughs> cougar and black bear, wolves, um, bats, fox, got a fisher. So lots of different animals. Um, rattlesnakes, timber rattlesnakes are found in our park and in our area. Um, the bottom left is a Pleistocene snail. It's a rare snail that's kind of a relic from the last ice age, and they're still found on those algific talus slopes. This is a pickerel frog, which is a rare frog found in, the, in our area. Um, and then different game species that have been pursued for you know, sport and for food. Um, the wild turkey, the beaver, the white-tailed deer. Anybody know what this bottom right bird is? I think if you go to the Bell Museum, they, they talk about it. I used to work at the Bell Museum when I was a student here. That's a passenger pigeon that went extinct, but at one time there were millions of them in Minnesota. So um, I'm gonna revisit these animals toward the end of the presentation, just to look at how their populations have changed uh, since, um, I guess, American settlement in the whitewater area. Lots of birds use the whitewater valley, um, over 200 different species. Um, some of those are migratory birds that are just there in the spring and fall, but it's a, it's a birding hotspot. We have a lot of folks that come from all over just to look for birds in the valley. And people have been using the Whitewater Valley for uh, millennia. So the Dakota and their ancestors lived in the valley long, long ago. And we still have Dakota people living in the area today. Um, and that's who the, I guess you could say the first American settlers um, made contact with when they arrived in the area in the, the 1850s. Um, and then, you know, that's kind of a whitewashing of <laughs> settlement and, and history in the area because if we can go back to Father Louis Hennepin in the 1600s, came up the Mississippi River and made notes of the area. Uh, you have the French fur traders that had 
forts up and down the Mississippi River, and we're intermarrying with the Dakota people in the area. Um, the oral history research I've been doing, the interviews, we're finding um, early Black settlers in the area, and some of those part of the Underground Railroad, which is a fascinating piece of history that's never really been looked at closely in Minnesota until recently. Um, so there's a lot of diversity in the story of who some of these early folks coming into Minnesota were. Um, but 1851 is when things really start changing, uh, especially for the Dakota living in our area. Um, the Treaty of Traverse des Sioux was signed, and that opened up settlement west of the Mississippi River in southeast Minnesota. So that's when we really start to see this influx of American settlers coming into the area there. Um, this is a poem that was written supposedly by someone who witnessed the signing of this treaty. Uh, it's a pretty sad poem. It says, give way, give way, young warrior, thou and thy steed give way. Rest not though lingers on the hills, the red sun's parting ray. The rocky bluff and prairie land, the white man claims them now. The symbols of his course are here, the rifle, ax, and plow. So basically a land rush ensues um, after the signing of this treaty. And people started rushing into the area pretty quickly, um, even though technically they weren't uh, supposed to be you know, staking their claim on the land until the government had, had it surveyed. Um, but people were squatting all over the place, kind of staking their claims, just waiting for the surveyors to come through. Um, so we see this big influx in like 1854 in the Whitewater Valley is when like the earliest American settlers started kind of settling in the valley. Um, they're coming from out east by and far many of these first American settlers into our area in southeast Minnesota. Uh, were Yankee East Coast born folks that had been born in the United States. Um, and then we start to see the European immigrants um, around the time of the Civil War and shortly after the Civil War, that's when we start to see that influx of European immigrants in the area. Um, so they're going to take railroad west to, I want to say it was like St. Louis, and they'd come up by steamboat to like Winona. Then they'd purchase a, a oxen and a cart and they'd head up from Winona into the Whitewater Valley. Uh, quite a quite a journey with everything they owned, you know, in a trunk. And Minnesota looked different at the time. So we had, um, it was a territory, <laughs> and we had these big chunks that what we would call counties today, very different from the Minnesota we know today up in the upper right corner there, Look, went out into the Dakotas. Um, when the government sent the land surveyors uh, into the area then to start surveying and platting everything, um, it's really fascinating because in their journals, they would note certain things about the landscape. They would note key trees around them. They would note soil. They would note the topography of the land, um, some of the plants around them. Um, and so these were all cataloged, you know, in these handwritten um, journals of these land surveyors. And then, and you can pipe in here and correct me if I'm wrong. I want to say it was in the eight in the 1960s. This guy by the name of Marshner, and I believe he worked out in Washington D.C., um, got the idea of being able to take the land surveyor notes and create these maps so that we get a visual glimpse of what the landscape looked like as far as the plant communities back in the 1850s at the time of, I guess you can say, American settlement. So this is Winona County um, at the time of the land survey in 1857. You can actually pull up the, sur the land survey notes. Uh, hopefully everybody knows this. I, I mean, I just learned this in the last few years. <laughs> so to me, it was mind blowing, but they've digitized all of them. And so you can actually find those for where you live and like see what it was like in your area um, in the 1850s, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is looking at Winona County, 1857. Yellow areas are prairie, orange is oak savanna. Um, let's see, the grayish areas are those floodplain forests, those kind of greenish, sorry, the colors are kind of poor on here, but the greenish is the upland deciduous forest. And then we've got some um, wet prairies. This is a highly generalized map. There's a more detailed one I brought with on the table up here that breaks it down even to more smaller, like specific types of communities, little niche, niche communities. Um, but that's interesting to see. Um, and we're gonna look at toward the end of this, what, what the map looks like today, because it's changed a lot. So people were drawn to the Whitewater Valley very quickly because of the water, right? We have the Whitewater River, and then there's also Beaver Creek. There's some other little tributary streams. So water is really important, obviously, for these um, early settlers. We've got um, water that's going to not only be for drinking and cleaning, but before electricity, right? How did you power the sawmills, power the grist mills? Um, it was water. So um, that's one of the reasons why they settled where they did. And I'm focusing on Beaver Village in this story. At one time, there were five villages in the Whitewater Valley. Um, we're just going to be like really looking closely at Beaver Village in this presentation. 
Um, oh, also water was important for ice, right? Before we had refrigerators, ice was used to keep everything cool in these ice sheds. So um, ice was harvested actually in Beaver. They had a mill pond where they cut ice in the wintertime too. And even at Whitewater State Park, the Civilian Conservation Corps um, put in a pond, like a swimming area, and that was used to cut ice um, in the 1940s and such. So here's another map of the Whitewater Valley. Um, we can see Whitewater State Park down in the gray there. Everything in orange is the uh, wildlife management area. So like I said, that's about 30,000 acres. And then when you get up closer to the Mississippi River, which is up at the top right of the map, you see some green areas. That's um, state forest lands. And then if we were to expand into the upper right corner a little bit more, there's um, scientific and natural area. There's another wildlife management area. And then we meet the national refuge, the U uh, US Upper Mississippi National Wildlife and Fish Refuge that runs from Wabasha down to Rock Island, Illinois. So it's pretty awesome, this contiguous corridor of public lands here. Um, in the valley, if we were leaving Whitewater State Park, um, we get up to, does this thing have a pointer on it? I need the point. The red thing. Oh, there we go. Ah, that's fancy pants. Okay, so we leave Whitewater State Park, and here's Elba. That was one of the villages in the valley, and it's still there today. But the population of Elba is like 70 people or something. Not maybe it's not even 70. It's pretty tiny. You've seen it. <laughs> uh, if we go to the west, Fairwater is just a I don't know mile and a half out of Elba. That was a village there. Never was a huge village, but it was a scattering of maybe a dozen farms. If we keep following Highway 74 north, we come to um, this spot that today is the Whitewater Wildlife Management Area headquarters. So it looks like an old farm site there, but that was a that was a town there um, that had a post office and um, several businesses and things back in the day. And this is actually was an old stagecoach trail. This trail that leads out to the Marnock House was an old stagecoach trail. It was called the Orinoco Trail, and it was a pretty busy thoroughfare. It took people up towards Orinoco and then on up towards what we call the Twin Cities today. So a lot of people traveling that path. And if you know, you know the history of roads, that most likely was a, a Indian footpath long ago. A lot of times our roads and stagecoach trails follow these old footpaths. Um, if we continue north, then we come to where Beaver Village was, and then further north up to where the Mississippi River is, that was the town of Weaver. So there were five villages. Today it's only Elba and Weaver that are left, and there's not much left of those towns. I think there's less than 50 people living in each of those towns. Um, so there have been some um, books, I guess you could say, written, some stories gathered about some of these little um, towns that were in the valley. Um, there's this book, The Beaver Story, 100 Years in the Whitewater Valley that came out in the 1960s. It was put together by the Winona County Historical Society. And it was actually a couple um, older folks at the time who had lived in Beaver Village, grown up going to school there and uh, moved on and they came back and they saw like the, the town was gone. And so they like, we need to collect stories from the people that had lived in this town. So they interviewed a bunch of people and gathered stories. So this is nice. We have like some stories and testimonials from people that lived in Beaver Village. Um, and there's been, a, there's a book about Weaver and then some other stories have been gathered. But this is a quote from uh, one, of the, one of the stories in the Beaver story here. She says, when I close my eyes, I can see Beaver as it was many years ago when I was a child. It was a wonderful place for play with its meadows, its brooks, the common and the hills with their endless variety of flowers. Before my father settled in Beaver in about 1865, he toured this part of the country and then wrote about it to a cousin back in New York state. He praised specifically the beauty of Whitewater Valley and the fertility of its soil. So just a reminiscence about the, the valley. And a lot of people, you know, you know, she said from New York, a lot of these folks, you know, were coming from that area and they compared it to kind of that upstate New York. I, I even hear that from visitors today, that it has that, that look to it. I've never been to upstate New York, but I'll have to check it out sometime. So like I said, 1854 is when some of those earliest settlers come into Beaver. Um, I mentioned the Marnock House, that's a, on the National Historic Register. It was built in 1857 by John and Nicholas Marnock. So that's a father and son who came from Luxembourg. Luxembourg is a tiny little country like between Belgium and Germany. Have you ever been to Luxembourg, Andrew? No, I'll check that one out sometime. Uh, so it's a tiny little country and uh, they were stonemasons. And so they built this home 
true Luxembourg style. It follows the architecture of the way houses were being built at that time period in Luxembourg. So that's one of the reasons it's on the National Historic Register because it's got unique architecture. This is it before it was restored. It's been restored since. And actually the um, prime minister of Luxembourg came to the ribbon cutting ceremony. So it was kind of a big, big thing. Um, so, but this is way back up that Orinoco stagecoach trail. You have to hike in a mile and a half to get to it. Um, and they collected the stones over the course of a year. So they lived in kind of a dugout in the hillside and they collected these stones from the ravines and then built this, um, this home, which is just incredible. It has two foot thick walls, just a really neat place to visit. Um, so that's 1857. So, you know, 1850s, folks are arriving, immediately the landscape has changed, right? So the timber resources are um, harvested, I guess you could say, to fuel their fires, to build their homes. Some of that lumber is sent out east to places that had already depleted their lumber resources. So the forests are dramatically altered. And then what was prairie, you know, we saw that, that vegetation map, we had prairie and oak savanna. Um, those areas were plowed under. Anybody know what the early, the first crops were that were planted? by these early American settlers. We're, we're on this um, area here that's really historic in Minneapolis for the mills, right? It was wheat, and that was down in Southeast Minnesota. Wheat was grown um, all across the area there on those highlands where the prairies once were. Uh, so lots of wheat being grown. By 1868, Winona was the fourth largest wheat market in the entire country. So a lot of wheat being grown down around the Whitewater area there. Um, so the landscape has changed from prairie, oak savanna, uh, hardwood forest to, uh, to cropland. If it's too steep to put crops on, they're going to graze it with livestock. So they're going to utilize it somehow. Um, and then we start to see this innovation in um, implements, farming implements. And with the advent of the steam engine, um, they're able to farm bigger, bigger parcels of land, a little bit steeper hillsides. So that really adds to the... Um, Kind of the change in land use there. I mentioned hillsides are going to be grazed. You can already see what's happening in the picture here. We've got gullies forming. Oop. Um, we're going to skip this. Usually I would call some kids up and we would do a little experiment <laughs> uh, just to kind of stress how water moves across the landscape when you have a kind of a healthy natural plant community and then you maybe change it um, to plants that don't have as de deep and dense a root system. Uh, this is Sherman Card and his family. Sherman was a Civil War veteran, and he settled in Beaver and ran the Valley House Hotel. Um, so Beaver was like some of these other little early communities. It was a, a point along a major travel route where folks hauling grain from these uplands to get it to the market um, on the Mississippi River had to come down through the valley. So you imagine they're hauling it by wagon with oxen or, or a horse, they're coming through the, the valley and they would put up for the night at the hotel because back in the day, it was a several day journey just to get to the river to unload your, your wheat. Um, and so a lot of people traveled through uh, Beaver Village on their way to and from uh, Winona and the Mississippi River. Um, this is the Beaver School. This is around the year 1900, 50 pupils. So it's kind of a, kind of a big school for a, a little pioneer village. Here's a bird's eye view of what the town looked like. If you ever read like the Little House on the Prairie books, I grew up, that was a TV show that was on after school every day. So when I was learning about Beaver Village, there was a whole lot of like echo of like what it seemed like uh, uh, Little House on the Prairie kind of times, right? Um, 1890s, the flooding starts in Beaver. Um, here's their paddling down Main Street. And the floods just get more frequent and more intense. So this is another, this is the exact same bird's eye view of the town and almost every home or business is underwater here. And this starts to become the norm, the norm there. Um, we start to see more and more gullies forming, getting bigger. Well, here's the 1894 plat of the village. They had, you know, ambitious dreams for this little town. Just another angle, another view. Um, here's a farm field after a flood. This is sand, and there's a fence post, you know, in the middle there. So I don't know how tall a fence post usually is, but it's half underwater there. It looks like a lot of that corn is half buried in sand. This is just one flood event. So you could have a flood event that leaves behind three feet of sand. That's kind of scary. Here's a corn field during a flood. And then it all kind of culminated 1938. 
this town, Beaver Village, flooded 28 times just that one year. So I don't know if anybody here has ever lived through a flood. Uh, that's a scary thing. And then it's a lot of cleanup. Uh, my husband's family is from Rushford in 2007. We had the historic flood where Whitewater had like 13 inches of rain in a 24 hour period. And there was a lot of destruction in the park, but um, nearby communities like Rushford, Stockton, they were devastated, seven people died. And in Rushford, my husband's um, parents' place, the basement flooded up to the main floor. So the main floor boards got all soaked too. Uh, FEMA came in and actually um, condemned a lot of places after that big flood, um, but they were able to clean up their place. They had to disinfect everything. It was, it was quite a, a process. Um, so I can't imagine doing that 28 times, having to go through that, especially if you have three feet of sand you know, in your house that you have to dig out, like, and I don't, you know, I, I, I wouldn't assume every single flood had three feet of sand it was depositing, but still, you can have a lot of muck to clean up each time. So 1938 was kind of when a lot of folks from Beaver Village said, yeah, this maybe isn't the best place to, uh, to be living, and they started kind of migrating out of the valley. Um, here's a picture, just this is along Highway 74 after a flood. That's sand. That's scary. 1955, this is the Winona Daily News a story. Soil washed downhill, village disappeared. Beaver is testimony to ruthless action. So 1950s, they started to recognize that it was the land use that was causing these floods, right? So when we take away the, the native plant communities that have these massive dense root systems that can hold the soil in place, that can absorb water and runoff, um, we see water running so quickly off the land and it's taking the soil with it and it's creating these gullies on the hillsides. All that sediment has to be deposited somewhere, it ends up down below in the valley on the people's homes and farms and businesses. Um, but early on, there's even some mentions in that Beaver uh, We Remember storybook about people saying like, oh yeah, the frost was heaving the rocks up out of the ground. They didn't realize it was actually the soil washing away, exposing the rocks. They thought it was the frost pushing the rocks up out of the ground. They didn't quite understand that they were causing the, the flooding, the erosion. Uh, it took a, a few decades before that um, was figured out. Um, or over the course of this time too, we lose a lot of our wildlife. So when, when we say extirpated, what does that mean, extirpated? Any idea? Means the animal does not live in that place anymore, but isn't extinct. Right, it's not extinct, but it's been hunted to the point where it's gone from that area, right? So the turkey, the beaver, the white-tailed deer, that's hard to imagine. Canada goose is another one, right? Like animals today that we go like, what, there's so many deer, there's more deer in Minnesota today um, than there was in the entire country at the time of settlement. That's crazy to think about. Um, so how is it that they were gone for a while there? But besides the fact that they were overhunted, because this is pre-hunting regulations, right? Um, we also destroyed their habitat, so they had no place to live. And then the passenger pigeon we mentioned had, had gone extinct in that time period. Um, they were completely overharvested. <laughs> So 1931, so this is a little bit before the big floods in Beaver, right? Because that was 1938. 1931, the Isaac Walton League, which is an amazing conservation organization. It's one of the oldest conservation organizations that we have in the United States. They're still around today. They do amazing work. Um, they petitioned the state legislature and they said, you know, farmers are starting to flee. Farmers were like basically becoming refugees. They were fleeing the wrath of nature in the Whitewater Valley. And they uh, a lot of them had to kind of scrap out what they could and try to start somewhere else. Nobody wanted to buy land in the valley at that time because it was it was a mess down there. So the Isaac Walton League um, throws out this idea that maybe the state could start buying up these farms from the farmers. Um, that way the farmers get a little money, they can go reestablish themselves somewhere else. And the valley could maybe slowly be transformed into like a game refuge. So they kind of plant that idea in 1931. Problem is think about what's going on in in the world around that time. We got Great Depression, we got like World War II is gonna be coming up before long there. So there's some big things going on in the world that there's not a lot of money just laying around to like start buying up all these farms. So um, it was a slow process in the beginning. They were able to purchase the very first farm in 1932. And that's what is our Crystal Springs trout hatchery today. If you visit the Whitewater Valley, that's where the 
um, Department of Natural Resources Division of Fisheries raises um, trout there. So um, they purchased the first farm in 1932. 1933, the Elba Fire Tower was constructed. You can hike that fire tower. Um, still today, they restored it so people can go up there and hike up that, uh, get a nice panoramic view of the valley. Um, that was built with help from the, um, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which is a program of the New Deal. Um, and that tower has an interesting story because most fire towers, you think, oh, it's to stop wildfires, right? Like when lightning strikes or if somebody's camping and the fire gets out of control. But this fire was, or this tower was built because landowners were purposely burning the hillsides um, to clear the forest so that they could graze the hillsides. And that was just exacerbating erosion issues. So that's an interesting um, story behind the fire tower that I've not found with other fire towers out there. Um, in 1938, the Pittman-Robertson Act was passed and this put a tax on guns and ammunition used for hunting. So this created a pot of money, that's federal pot of money that states could apply for, and they can use it to restore wildlife habitat. So this was a, a source of funding to allow the Department of Conservation, which is what the DNR used to be called, the Department of Conservation, to be able to start buying up some of these farms in the Whitewater Valley. And this man, Richard J. Dorr, was hired to oversee the Pittman-Robertson funds for the state of Minnesota. And Richard Dorr, you know, he, if you study conservation in Minnesota, he's kind of a, an early conservation figure that's kind of in the history books. And he's uh, originally from Ohio. Um, he's from a part of Ohio that's right across from West Virginia. So I've heard uh, interviews with him talking where he talked about growing up in Appalachia. Um, and knowing trees from a young age, how, how to navigate through the woods just by um, following the trees. Um, you take that big oak until you get to the big beach and then you go east and then you head to the, you know, the big, whatever, willow tree. So he knew trees from a young age. He knew he wanted to do something conservation oriented. He grew up where strip mining like had just destroyed the landscape. So he was always kind of um, moved by that as a young person. Um, he served in World War I. He studied at West Point Military Academy. Then he ended up working for a timber cruiser. Um, and then somehow finds his way to Minnesota to the Department of Conservation. Um, he's also the father of the Save the Wetlands movement, which was a national movement to protect wetlands on agricultural lands. Um, so uh, this guy was a pretty, um, he was a crusader. He, they call him the militant steward because he was very aggressive in his, um, his efforts to really try to protect the Whitewater Valley and later all of Southeast Minnesota. Um, so he oversees the Pittman-Robertson funds and what he saw in the Whitewater Valley, it reminded him a lot of where he grew up in Ohio, but he, he said, here I actually have a chance to protect it, to save it, unlike in Ohio where his home, his home area was destroyed. So they start buying up these farms. Um, 1916, this is the Appleby farm, which on the map of the Whitewater Valley today, um, it shows Appleby Pool, and it's, uh, it's a spot now where there actually there was 100 trumpeter swans on it the other day when I led a swan tour. Um, so it's kind of a popular spot for wildlife photographers and stuff. Um, but there used to be a farm there. In 1916, Frank Appleby, who's over on the left there, he was a Civil War veteran. Um, he ran this farm. It was a little over 200 acres, and he sold the farm to his son, Highland, who's over here on the right. And Highland bought it at market value from his father. So it was $16,000. You have to realize, right, the, the value of the dollar has changed since <laughs> then. Because um, 16000 for 200 and some acres, whew, that's a great deal. Um, in 1943, after all the flooding, when their, um, their lower uh, crop land down in the valley and the floodplain was completely buried and destroyed. And then they had grazed up on the hillside behind the house. It goes up to a bluff. They had grazed that and that had started to slough and like basically erode onto the back of the house. So the house was filling in with sediment. So they sold their farm to the state, Highland sold to the state. He got $4,750. So, you know, that's a pretty big loss compared to what he had paid for the farm. Um, but he was happy to have some money and be able to move up to Plainview, which is a town up on the highlands where the Oak Savannah used to be and kind of re reestablish up there. So that's one example. There was over 100 farms in the Whitewater Valley. Today, there's like three or four left. So that's a story of many, many people that you know lived in the valley. Um, the Department of Conservation set to getting roots back in the ground, uh, replanting those hillsides. 
Um, unfortunately, some of the trees that were planted, now we know this term invasive species. We didn't <laughs> really think about that back in the day, right? So some things that were planted now we're like having to go in and remove the buckthorn and the tartarian honeysuckle. But uh, some of that stuff was planted early on just to get roots back in the ground and hold that soil in place. Um, we also start to see the soil conservationists arrive on the scene. So Winona County was the first county in Minnesota to establish a soil and water conservation district. That's a pretty big deal. And so you have these soil conservationists working with the farmers, going out onto their farms, walking the land with them, and trying to figure out ways to adapt their farming practices so there's less runoff and less erosion. So we start to see things like terraces and contour strips, which if you do like a Google flyover of Southeast Minnesota today, it looks like a quilt work, right? The way these crops are planted to follow the contours. Uh, but that wasn't the case, you know, pre 1940s. Um, and this was cutting edge. This was like, for some people kind of scary, like you're asking me to do what? <laughs> Why? Um, and they really had to convince some of these farmers to change their practices a little bit. Um, actually, some of the early soil conservationists were also farmers and they basically just, did these practices on their farms to, as an experiment, right? To show them how the profits actually increased. And now we have like ag experiment stations that do that. But this was some of these early soil conservationists like experimenting and trying to convince their, their fellow neighbors to try these practices. So um, Stan Trimble is one of the people who um, you've been taking the work and um, Jimmy has. His, some of his data and trying to roll it into this project. Um, Stan Trimble put together this book I don't recommend it for everybody, but this group of folks might be interested in it. Historical Agriculture and Soil Erosion in the Upper Mississippi Valley Hill Country. And in here, he really looks closely at Coon Valley, Wisconsin, which is over by La Crosse, and then the Whitewater Valley. Um, and so he was able to get some of those early soil conservation service photos and then compare with more modern photos. But this is just looking at when we're talking about contour strips. 1934 in the upper left, you can see everything's planted in these rows, perfectly straight rows, and then compare that to 1967, exact same aerial view, but you can see these contours. It looks really artistic, but it's following the shape of the land. It's allowing to kind of slow the flow of the water off the landscape. And then dikes and settlement ponds, that was a new concept back in the day too, which those are pretty common on the landscape still today to, to catch that water when it's coming off the fields, allow the sediment to kind of filter out. Rotational grazing was a new concept back in those days. So instead of throwing your cattle in this one huge pasture, you break it down into smaller paddocks, you rotate every so often so they're not over compacting the soil and, and over grazing. So those were new concepts that are pretty common across um, the landscape in Southeast Minnesota today. Uh, a lot of the farmers in our area in the whitewater watershed practice um, some of those practices there. Um, 1946, Richard Doerr's big kind of master plan for the Whitewater Valley was approved. And it took a while because uh, the Whitewater Valley lies within three counties. So we <laughs> talking about partnership building earlier, like our watershed group has county commissioners from three different counties. I mean, the more, the more counties, the more people involved, it gets a little harder to move forward on stuff, right? So it took a little while, but 1946 is when they approved his big plan for 38,000 acres. And we're actually only at about 28,000 right now. So um, they're still acquiring farms every so often when landowners want to sell to the state if they're within kind of that statutory boundary of where the, the wildlife management area kind of sees as um, target lands that would be uh, good to bring into the wildlife refuge, I guess. Um, they named these pools after Richard Doerr. Um, it's a series of man-made wetlands in the lower portion of the valley that collects the, uh, the runoff and it provides great water um, fowl habitat. A lot of different sandhill cranes and eagles and um, swans and all kinds of birds that use it throughout the year. Um, so this was spring 2013. We had had a lot of snow that year. And so this was after the snow melted. It's just kind of neat to drive through there and see like, okay, I get why people can't farm here. I mean, look, look at this. It's like completely flooded. It goes over the road oftentimes. Highway 74 is a highway, but you wouldn't know that when you drive it because it's gravel. And the funny thing is in the 1920s, it was the first concrete highway in the state of Minnesota. It was like a big deal at the time. Today, it's the only um, gravel highway in the state. And it's because it floods so frequently, it's like really hard to maintain it. Plus, I guess we could say the original highway is probably how many feet below what we drive on today because it's been buried with you know, every flood that's come through there. 
Um, and I mentioned the Whitewater River uh, at Weaver meets the Mississippi River. Um, and then you've got this corridor that goes down to Illinois that's um, public lands. So really awesome corridor for wildlife and for humans um, and plant communities that uh, is kind of unique. So um, this is just a glimpse of where the town used to be. I was up on um, a bluff looking down, kind of similar to where those photos were taken before. And today you can't really tell there was a town there. You've got two roads that intersect. Uh, depending on what time of year, if you're snooping around in the woods, you can find um, bits and pieces of like old bridges and things like that. But um, I, I have to imagine there's a lot of people that hunt in the wildlife refuge that don't even realize there was a town there. Um, which is kind of sad. So this is a, another quote from that book. Um, this guy was born in Beaver, went to school there till he was 16 years old, and then their family moved, and he came back to visit it and was just blown away that like, the town's gone, there's no sign even that there was a town there. Can you imagine going to your hometown and it's just like gone? <laughs> and there's nothing acknowledging it ever even existed. So um, pretty traumatic for him. So as naturalists, we're always trying to find ways to share these stories with people in a way that's engaging, but also meaningful and provokes them to you know, want to get involved somehow. So one of the things we kind of did here, we were trying to figure out when you look at that area today, where the buildings were, where the, the homes were, where the businesses were, and then how can we create something interpretive to help people understand that that was a town. Um, so one of the things we looked at here, see if I can bring it up. Using the technologies we have today, which is pretty cool. So we pulled up the Google Earth image of the area. We pulled, put a plat, uh, or the LIDAR to show the indentations. We put a plat map over the top of that. We put pins on where all the buildings used to be, pull that back off. And you can see the pin marks match up with LIDAR indentations. So luckily my coworker, he's really into, <laughs> he's into the techie stuff because I don't know how to do any of this. But now we could do, we were thinking like we could do a geocaching or something like that, right? Because that's something that people get excited about the recreational side of it, but you can make it educational too, where they're actually going and finding these places where these people lived and worked. So we're, we're playing around with some of these ideas. <laughs> um, I threw in a couple interview excerpts. We'll try, we'll try one here and see if, it, if we can hear it okay. Um, this is a story from uh, Elaine Holes. She was born, as she said it, born in a shack on a hill um, hillside above uh, Appleby Pool. She went to school all of her early years in Beaver Village, and she experienced several different floods. Um, her grandparents homesteaded on Beaver Creek, which is what the, t uh, the village of Beaver was named after, Beaver Creek. And um, this is the house that they lived in. It, it got to, it's gotten moved out of the wildlife area since then, but this is the house that her grandparents lived in. And um, she remembers being in that house for different floods. So let's see if we can hear her story. She's talking about a flood here. No, it's not gonna cooperate. We tested this out early, what the heck? That's okay, I can, I can summarize it. Um, yeah, so she talks about um, going into this house and here you could actually hear the sound of the. Oh, mute down. Okay, let's let's try it again. Thank you. 
ignorance about this part of the issue. That was sterile. And the next spring, Moses was just a couple of seeds. So she's talking about, oops. <laughs> yeah, they walked from that house. It was a couple miles to get back to where Whitewater Falls is from Beaver. And that's where they walked to because that stoning cemetery is over by Whitewater Falls. So they're walking in the dark because she said it was like midnight. It was after midnight trying to get to higher ground away from this flood. So how scary being a little girl and experiencing that. Um, Mike Siebenhaller is another person I interviewed. Um, the Siebenhaller family, that's another place on the, when you look at the map of the Whitewater Wildlife Management Area, all the ridges and valleys are named after different families that farmed in the valley. So there's a Siebenhaller Ridge, it's like a mile long ridge. The Siebenhaller family farmed up there. And so um, Alex Siebenhaller is the man in the pictures here. Um, his um, wife, and him lived up on the farm. They had like 14 kids. It was a big family. Um, and then eventually, um, well, I'll let him tell the story. They were up on the ridge, so the flooding wasn't impacting them. It's something else that drove them out of the valley, but it was related to the flooding. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> he's, all, he's on top. Share screen, share sound. Yeah. But then you've probably seen District 114 school up there. Do you know? You don't know where oh, that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you hit that intersection, yeah, yep, you yep. Need to go towards Altura. You go down to Trout Valley yeah. or Altura. Yeah, that was the school for oh, the neighborhood. Wow. It was District 114. It's now owned by. Um, uh, Richard and Karen Aarons out of Lewiston. Okay. They bought it and they're kind of trying to preserve it. It used to, mm. maybe 20, 25 years ago, it used to be a corn crib. Really? And they took it back. But wow. this is where my mom, I don't think my dad went to school, but this is where my mom went to school through mm. eighth grade. They'd walk over from, you know, from Cronobush Hill. So that would be where. So people yeah. getting flooded out. The, the people on the ridge were willing to settle. Or settle. They, they would sell. Um, I remember my mom and dad telling the story. Of, well, it's in my mom's book, too, where the kids were all little. All of a sudden, they were going to start school. So they decided the state was, you know, that, what was that, Pittman Robert? Yeah, 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 the funding came yeah, through. Yeah, came through. And the state was offering to buy land, and they thought, how can these little kids, we can't afford to drive them to school, all this stuff. So they decided to move to town. And they moved to, I believe, St. Charles. Okay. And so then they sold their land to the state. My grandfather, Peter Cronbush, was not happy. Yeah. Not happy <laughs> at all. Because he had sold half his farm to my dad and mom. But, you know, you got little kids in your own. And that's a long ways back. Right. I mean, for little kids to walk, try to walk to school, and there's no school. 114 was closed already, so, so they yeah. moved to town. But so the schools, the schools were closing down. These little country schools were closing down as the people were leaving the valley, right? There's just not enough kids to um, keep the school open. So some of these people kind of felt like they had no choice. They had to move closer to the bigger towns. To, if they wanted their kids to go to school, they didn't have a vehicle to be able to drive um, to and from town. Um, so, and then he mentions Grandpa Cronenbush was not happy that we sold to the state because he didn't want to sell to the state, but he sold his farm to, you know, his daughter and son-in-law, and then they ended up selling it to the state. And one of the, another reason they weren't happy is because um, what he told me was once the state bought some of those um, farms, they created an area called sanctuary 
Um, and today that's the game refuge, right? There's a game refuge within the wildlife management area. So the wildlife management area is about 30,000 acres and there's like a 2,800 acre game refuge that has stricter hunting rules. You have to, they only draw by lottery a few people that can hunt in there each year. So it's a safe zone for the deer. And it used to be sanctuary when they were first trying to bring white-tailed deer back. This was a zone you couldn't even walk in it or you would get uh, ticketed. Um, and that's where their farm had been. So they were really like, upset because they couldn't even go back and visit the old farm site. So it's interesting. And we do, we get, we hear from different people how, you know, different perspectives on the state owning all this land in the valley. And um, there's all these different reasons why people maybe aren't happy about the Department of Natural Resources having bought up these farms. Well, let's see here. But then you've probably seen district. Um, I'm just going to summarize these next ones because I think these uh, these clips are a little long. So Charlie Loggins was actually district conservationist for the Soil Conservation Service, um, and he was hired in the early 1970s, I believe. Um, and the first I ever learned of Charlie was I was uh, going through some old newspaper clippings that were in a file, and I saw a picture of him, and I'm like, that's awesome. There's an African-American man working for the Soil Conservation Service. I want to know more about this guy. Nobody could tell me anything. Nobody like, I don't, I don't know, I don't know much about him. So through the oral history project, I started asking more and more questions and eventually interviewed some folks with the Soil Conservation Service who had known Charlie. And then I was able to finally track down Charlie. So I was able to interview Charlie, which was awesome. He was down in Ohio. That's where he retired. And um, gosh, within a year after I interviewed him, he passed away. So it was neat to be able to get his story. Um, but he worked with a lot of the farmers in the Whitewater area um, on the federal level helping to kind of um, administer some of those grant programs and different programs they had to help farmers Im implement conservation. So he had a really neat perspective on his time working in Minnesota. He said he wouldn't trade it for the world. He loved working in Southeast Minnesota. And um, he said, what we've been able to do in Southeast Minnesota with the conservation um, is, a, is a big story. It's a model that could be you know, modeled across the country. And he said, what's really neat is oftentimes how you treat the land is an indication of how you treat people as well. And he said he never had any problems living in Southeast Minnesota. He made a lot of good friends that were lifelong friends. So it was a really um, emotional interview. I thought it was really neat. Do you watch um, So when we think about Beaver Village, the town that I'm talking about, how is that like the Titanic? You know the story of the Titanic? Where, where's the Titanic? <laughs> it's at the bottom of the ocean, right? Um, so I would say it's like, it's buried at the bottom of the ocean. And the village of Beaver is buried under who knows how much sediment. That's what you're looking into, right? <laughs> I mean, I've heard like maybe 15 feet of sediment um, because every flood, right, has brought in more and more sediment. And some of these floods brought in like three feet of sediment at a time. So it's kind of hard to imagine that. Um, we're really lucky today with a lot of education and conservation work. Some of these um, animals have come back. Some of them we have way more now than we ever did. Um, but the turkey, the wild turkey's back. We have more wild turkeys in Minnesota than we ever have ever had. They've spread way further north than we ever thought they would. Um, beaver, that's hard to imagine the beaver were gone from Southeast Minnesota, but they're pretty common again today on the landscape. Um, and the white-tailed deer, holy moly. So people come through the Whitewater Valley and they're like, wow, this is an awesome paradise. It's so cool this place was protected. Not understanding like, well, it went through some serious destruction and it's on its way to recovery, but it's never gonna be fully restored because we've lost things, right? Like the passenger pigeons are gone. They're never coming back. We're never gonna experience what this valley was like, um, you know, 200 years ago. Um, some of the things we're seeing on the landscape, I mentioned it's an agricultural watershed. So that's what's really impacting um, the watershed and the river there. Um, the change with um, livestock farming, Winona used to be like the dairy capital of Minnesota, Winona County. Um, they've lost so many dairy farms. And so when I was, you know, coming out of college with my little degree in natural resources, the idea was like livestock are so bad for the natural environment. And there's tr some truth to that. And there's also a flip side of that where large herbivores are part of the natural landscape. They have been for thousands of years. So it's all in like how they are um, I guess, interacting with the land. When we had dairy farms, we had hay ground and we had pasture. We had a lot of roots in the ground. Um, same with beef cattle. They're out there on pasture. They're being, a lot of these beef cattle on these small farms are fed hay. They're fed grass that's grown. 
that's different than corn and soybean, right? So having uh, roots in the ground is really important. And we've seen a loss of livestock. When we find livestock today, usually in our area, it's like a feedlot. It's a different type of farming livestock. And that, you know, there's some issues with feedlot farming. And we're also seeing a lot of these huge industrial size um, kind of monoculture farms um, where you have either all soybean or all corn. And then they just rotate a whole farm instead of rotating small patches of crops. It's a whole farm that gets rotated every um, year or two. Um, and so, you know, we, we need crops, right? It feeds the world, but we need to do it in a way that's sustainable. Um, this is a huge thing nobody talks about. What's going on in this picture? Tiling. Yeah, and tiling is like underneath almost every farm field, there's tubing that allows the water to drain quickly off the land to the nearest ditch where it's shot down right to the nearest um, stream, river, you know, water reservoir. Um, so we're, we're totally altering the hydrology, the natural hydrology of the land. Um, and this isn't like reported, like I tried to get information on this and like farmers don't really have to report this. There's no permitting process for it. And almost every farm field is tiled and drained. So that's something that never gets talked about, but it's a huge issue pretty much anywhere there's farming going on in, in Minnesota. Here's an example of a feedlot, and especially in Southeast Minnesota, where you talk about karst, you know, what's going on under the ground, it's already sensitive. And then when you have um, situations like this where you can end up having some massive contamination, um, I was telling Andrew earlier, the wastewater treatment facility in Altura, which is the nearest town to Whitewater, um, back in the 70s had a sinkhole open up overnight and millions of gallons of raw sewage drained away overnight. Um, they did dye tracing to try to figure out and like a bunch of that stuff, they never found where it ended up. And so talking about like there's pockets under the ground where things can be stored for generations and then eventually flush out and end up in the system again. So a um, lot of issues around, you know, what can happen when we have feedlots and things like that where things go wrong. Um, and like with pesticides and chemicals as well. So um, I know the technologies change where they can apply more directly and the, just the right amount that they need. Um, but what we see is we've had fish kills, what there was a big fish kill down by Rushford this year, 2015, we had a big fish kill on the South Fork of the Whitewater. Um, and most likely it's related to, um, actually that one was a fungicide, but it's a chemical put on the crops to, you know, whatever. Um, and it was applied when there was a like a one or two inch rainfall. That, that's like totally against the law. Um, so, you know, enforcing this, I guess it needs to be, enforcement needs to be stepped up too. Um, this was the, a huge issue a while back, the frac sand mining and, and how that's gonna Im, uh, impact Southeast Minnesota in particular, that kind of quieted down. But now I'm curious with the uh, gas prices, because um, it sounds like they're looking at bringing fracking back again in other parts of the country. So um, the sand that they use for that is mined, the silica sand um, is found throughout Southeast Minnesota. So that creates an interesting um, potential too. So this is our, our map today of the native plant communities that remain in Southeast Minnesota. So we've got the one on the upper left is that original one. And this is what's left today. It's just these little fragmented pieces here and there. And in the Whitewater Valley, you know, there's nice, nice areas there, but a majority of that now has been, you know, plowed under its cropland, it's our roads, it's our homes, it's our schools, it's our businesses. Um, there's not much left. So this is the Whitewater River here where it meets the Mississippi. It looks like it's puking. Look at all that. I mean, there's a lot of sediment that's still being carried um, through our watershed, which is sad. So you'd think like, oh, did we learn lessons from what happened in the 19, you know, early 1900s? Um, but things are slowly kind of looking like they're going backwards again. And that was something I found with this oral history interview project too, is some of these um, farmers saying, you know, we were, we, we were awarded conservation awards because of the work we did on our farm. And now we're, we turned it over to our kids and we're seeing the CRP land is being plowed up and they're, they're kind of going backwards in some ways. I think if you didn't live through those natural disasters, you maybe don't quite understand like why the conservation practices were so important. Um, we're not going to play this interview either, but in 2007, I mentioned seven people died. Um, John and Shirley McKeel. John McKeel worked for the Winona County Soil and Water Conservation District for his whole career, trying to help farmers, you know, implement these conservation practices. And he dies in the flood. That was Yes, it was a big rainfall event, but we know if more of the land had been in like uh, perennial vegetation, we would have had less 
flooding impacts. It's just kind of a, a sad thing to see. Some folks would be. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop there. I can keep going, believe me, look at this. I can just keep on going. <laughs> So I'll stop right there because I think it's four o'clock. The I guess the point is the problem's not solved. And uh, you know, how do we reach the current generation of farmers, the future farmers, to make sure these stories are told and shared? And that's where I'm excited to work with this research project because I think the data that you're digitizing, if we can figure out ways to share in a meaningful way so that we don't go backwards and see these same kind of tragic stories. So I'm going to be quiet. I don't know if there's any questions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, got a microphone. Oh, there. I can't hear my own voice. Um, I've seen, I've seen data of like where there's conservation tillage in like the Midwest, and it, I remember that the Driftless area was kind of a hot spot for conservation tillage where other places weren't. And I always thought, oh, is it just because it's like steeper in the driftless area? But I guess what you're telling me, there's more of a, I don't know, there's some sort of social aspect of it, like that they've seen the disasters close. Can you, yeah. is that what you've noticed as well? I guess from the driftless area versus other places that you work, that there's more conservation tillage and do you know why? Well, that would be like anecdotally. I mean, I guess I haven't dove into like the statistics and stuff, but yeah, a lot of these folks that went into like the soil conservation work, like that Alex Siebenaller, I didn't even mention that. He lives on the ridge. He's watching the valley be destroyed below him. He ends up working for the Soil Conservation Service and he's leading farmers on tours of the valley to teach. And Elaine Hull said the same thing. Like we did everything on our farm to protect the valley below because we didn't want to see that happen to, you know, to anybody else. So um, I think, yeah, those folks that went into those early soil water conservation positions were really inspired. And the people around they were talking to got it. Like, yeah, we know people who lost their home from these floods. I think here in the paper, I think that shows the, the data. So I think it's anecdotal, but also it, it actually shows that I think the satellite imagery is figure out that there is more conservation. Data. Sure. And maybe they created more incentives too. Um, in those prone, highly erosion prone areas. Cause that's like Richard J. Dorr, he went on to, after he retired to lobby for this state forest, this um, now we call it the Richard J. Dorr Memorial Forest, but it wasn't, he didn't want to name it after himself, but he wanted to protect all the steep hillsides in Southeast Minnesota so that they would remain in forest and then the rivers, the trout streams would be protected. Um, so then by doing that, by designating it as state forest all throughout there, there's a lot more incentives for landowners, there's like different programs, grants, things like that. So it could be too that they said, this is a really sensitive region. Let's make sure there's more programs and incentives for these farmers to participate in conservation practices. That's just me guessing, but it seems like that's kind of how it works sometimes. <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? I think it's a matter of time that it took very little to mess up the the um, and in the landscape and increase the erosion back in the early 1900. And so it will take a lot, a lot of time to go back to the situation where you keep erosion under control, or it's still a matter of farming practice and conservation. Yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, the farming in our area is the huge drive. And there's a there's a generational shift right now with a lot of folks turning it over to the, the next generation of farmers. Um, I don't know. I don't understand the whole like subsidy in agriculture, the federal agricultural program, but I know there's a lot that drives the way people what land use practices they choose to use based on what subsidies they get. Um, so there's a lot, you know, on the federal level too. But you think if you if you live in an area, you grow up in an area, you're farming the land that your grandparents farmed, you want to take care of that land. And that's one thing we're seeing too is a shift in um, folks renting out their land to these industrial farmers from out of state who they just see it as a, a you know, this is land I can farm, but they don't have that personal connection to it. And I think that's, a piece that um, I don't know how you 
how you change that. <laughs> but I think that's a piece of it too. We got a lot of people that are, um, they just rent the land. They don't live on that land. Yeah. Thanks. There we go. Sure, Jen has a question. We'll see if we can hear you, Jen. Does Hugh or Jen have a question? In that case, I, I might have a bunch of questions. <laughs> yeah. So Thanks again, Sarah. This is Andy um, speaking because no one can see me. Um, so one question I have is about the changes to the land, even between the pre-European arrival and the restoration efforts, because, of, well, of course, all the sediment that drains water very differently that might um, affect which species communities can grow there very differently. And then there are other things like the the door pools that are there for um, for wildlife, but of course, are totally it's totally unnatural to have a lake in this environment that was created by rivers. And so what I'm wondering about is, um, is if you can speak a little bit about what the goals are of the habitat restoration and of the environmental work and what vision it is that this river will be in the, in the future and kind of how to balance what you think of as the like pre-European arrival landscape and the landscape that you want to see into the future, knowing that you're at the state park and not at the W. I was gonna say, I'm gonna defer that to JB Edwards. No, I know that um, kind of like the, the planting of the buckthorn and tartarian honeysuckle, I think um, it's still a learning process. And I know Jamie um, Edwards is the manager now at the wildlife management area. And so I've asked her about the door pools. I'm like, what? what's the deal with the door pools? Because actually, if anything, if they're gonna keep them, they're filling in with sediment, you know? So something's gonna have to be done eventually. And she goes, no, that's a great question that we're looking to have some Kind of conversation around is like what should be done to manage these pools because yeah they're not natural they're provi providing wildlife habitat but at what cost to the right the river processes and the floodplain ecology and all that so i, I can't really answer that because that's with you know her her realm but i think that they're they're looking at a new way of maybe managing the floodplain yeah <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me.